I create the space by being vulnerable myself. Like I do all the assignments alongside them because I'm like, look, I need this just as much as you all do. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm not done. I'm not fixed. I'm not yeah, perfect. Never. I'm like, I need to be training also. So I'm doing this. It's like an aerobics instructor. I'm like, I'm doing this to stay in shape too. <laughs> Um, and so I said, you know, I come in, we do, we start off the day with highs and lows and, you know, I'll share like, you know, I lost my temper at my kids again and, and like, I'm still struggling with this and I don't know what to do. And, um, and I'm disappointed because I, my flight just got delayed. Um, and so we, we talk authentically and vulnerable. I mean, m my book is called the new right stuff and the, you know, the old right stuff was being smart and being tough and being able to handle, endure anything. And I say the new right stuff is being authentic and vulnerable um, and inspiring. Hello and welcome to the Making Better podcast, where we talk about how to make ourselves, our teams, and our organizations better. Whether you are a leader, a learning development professional, a coach, or a technical trainer, this show will give you actionable insights on how to improve your own performance and the performance of those around you. Our guest today is Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides. Loretta has pioneered her space kind leadership courses for space professionals that help them get in touch with their real mission, overcome imposter syndrome, and let go of resentment and frustration so that they can be more effective and move towards fulfillment. She will fly her suborbital space flight with Virgin Galactic in hopefully 2026. We'll get into that a little bit in the discussion today, maybe. Um, but before we get into that discussion, I just want to remind any new listeners to make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss a future episode. And if you are already a subscriber, I ask that you share this show with at least one other person, because that is how we grow. I can't tell you how much it means to me. And with that, let's get into the discussion. Loretta, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's fun. Excellent. Excellent. So Loretta, you we, we haven't chatted in quite a while, but we've known each other for, for years. And we went to, you had me over for a really great group dinner years ago. We both share this incredible, like kind of lifelong passion for space. How did you first get involved in space? Where does that passion come from for you? <laughs> I, I, sometimes we joke that I was just born that way. Um, because, because I've had this as long as I can remember, you know, so first memory, you know, kindergarten, I can remember sitting in the classroom, the teacher putting the Apollo astronaut on the billboard on the bulletin board. And she said, if you could learn all your alphabet, you could get your school picture in the faceplate of the astronaut. And I just remember at like five, just being like, oh man, I, I gotta do that. I, I better learn my alphabet. So, uh, you know, already at five, that was there. So I think it, it could have had to do with a little bit of Star Wars influence. And also okay. uh, we did a trip to the Kennedy Space Center when I was five. Um, and I don't really remember the trip, although there's pictures of me on the lunar rover holding on my space books, all excited. Nice. So I'm guessing that was one of those sort of really, um, you know, one of the foundational moments that, yeah, you know, the impressionable memory. age that, that shaped, shaped me. So yeah, it worked. It worked. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing like when you, when you have those experiences going to some of these places and standing next to the hardware, um, it is, it is different. It's a whole, it, it really is a, it, it's a life, it can be a life changing experience for sure. But, but I do think a, a lot of people have that experience, um, or start there, but you've really moved a lot closer to that. So, um, you know, we were just chatting before the episode. You, um, you're in line for going up on a Virgin Galactic flight. It looks like it's been pushed back a little bit now. For anybody that hasn't followed space flight a lot, what is Virgin Galactic, and kind of what, how, how are you involved there? <laughs> um, so, Virgin Galactic is um, Richard Branson's space tourism company. Um, they founded in 2004 when um, the Ansari X Prize was won by Bert Rattan and uh, Scaled Composites. And basically we, they have an airplane that um, has a rocket attached to the bottom of it and they take off on a runway, um, fly up to 50,000 feet, drop the rocket, light the rocket motor. We go up to space just for a couple of minutes, look at the curvature of the earth, the blackness of space, float around weightless um, and just take in you know, be the longest three and a half minutes of your life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, just being bowled over by, by what the incredible 
planet we get to live on. We're so lucky. This yeah. is the cool, by far the coolest planet we found yet. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, come back and land uh, on the runway, like a glider, kind of like the space shuttle did. So um, been excited, bought our tickets. You know, I worked for the X Prize Foundation at the time of that flight. So I was nice. right there when Virgin Galactic was announced. Um, and we bought our tickets a couple months later. Um, so we've been waiting since uh, April 12th, 2005. Um, for our flights. My husband and I, we're going to fly together as a honeymoon flight, but uh, you know, we've been married. Quite, we've got teenagers now. So, <laughs> um, uh, we're going to go. It's all, the flight's always, we joke, the flight's always two years off. And it, it was sort of funny uh, this week when the, we got a, a announcement of a flight delay because it's like, oh, our flight is two years off again. This is perfect. No, we're always. used to right comfortable with the flight being two years off. That's, that's yeah. normal. Yeah, it is. I mean, space is hard for sure, as anybody who is in the business will tell you. So, but that that's crazy that it's it's always been perpetually two years off. Have Have you gotten to talk to anybody that's gone up in uh, on a galactic flight yet? Yes. So that yeah. is but so the, uh, I'm a founder astronaut. So there, are, you know, I think there's about fifty of us now, um, and I'm. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm number seventeen. So we've flown seven of them now. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, I was, I'm 10th in line now on, on, <laughs> nice. on deck circle or whatever. Nice. So as soon as we get, uh, although they'll have some research flights and, and, uh, other flights they may be putting in between, but, um, yes. So I was fortunate. Um, I got to be out in New Mexico, which is where the runway is, where we fly. Our spaceport is in, mm -hmm. it's gorgeous, by the way, if you like, mm -hmm. if you're a Star Wars person like me, you got to go visit <clears throat> spaceport okay. America in New Mexico because it looks like it's straight out of Tatooine. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, it's, it's, it's a perfect place to launch space missions from. So I'm super excited for that. Anyway, I got to be at Spaceport America, um, back in October for, um, let's see, it was Galactic Four, they called it, um, okay. which was Ron Rosano, Trevor Beatty and, and Namira and Salim. And they, it was a fantastic flight. I was so grateful. I got to be there just to be caught up in the excitement of it all. And Trevor is a dear friend of mine. He's a British and um, it was such a a treat. I feel so grateful to be able to have been there for his flight. He was so, you know, you know when a British guy is like at a loss for words and overcome with emotion. Yeah, um, that, that it's a big day. Um, That's a big and, day. Yeah, you know, they handed the microphone right when he got off the she ship, uh, which is cool, kind of like they did with Shatner. Uh, sorry, yes. William Shatner. I'm speaking a little colloquially uh, from <laughs> his on Origin a couple two years ago, um, and he was just, you know, to see him like overcome with emotion, talking about like fulfilling a dream and being blown away by what he saw. And, um, that, uh, touched me. That was great. He's a, he's, and if you, if you follow him on Twitter, um, I think it's Trevor Beatty is just, anyway, if you search Trevor Beatty, you'll probably find him Virgin Galactic. Um, okay. his, his tweets have been the best so far of it. I mean, he's, he's an ad guy. He's from the advertising world. So he knows how to, how to sling. Wow. Out. And all of his tweets before and during and after his flight have been amazing. I'm like, can I just hire you to do my tweets? <laughs> um, so he's 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 a lot of fun. So it's great to get to be there to be a firsthand experience of that, that and turn in insights into what I should be expecting for when we do ours. Exactly. Yes. I mean, I, yeah, that had to be amazing. I mean, the yeah, because I've just for anybody, you know, kind of what you're talking about, you know, the the term of art for it is the overview effect. This, this feeling that people get when they see the, when they can really see the curvature of the earth. And for anybody who has, you know, go back and either watch it sounds like this flight or definitely the thing that I was amazed by was when William Shatner came down after his Blue Origin flight. And this is William Shatner, somebody who has been on screen for longer than most people have been alive. Like it's what he does. He just is out there talking. And for this man to just, not be able to find the words to describe what he experienced. I think it was a real testament to just how powerful of an experience that must be and why these kinds of things are important. Because I think, you know, it can get, it can, the talk of the tourist nature of it can, can sometimes diminish the importance of what having more people having these experiences could do for us as as a species i think absolutely yeah that's the part i get excited about it's like yeah um it's powerful enough to sort of wake you up and shake you out of whatever you know rut or 
autopilot we're in and and yeah. get realize what's important and and that's what we all want is to yeah. um you know not get caught up in the day to day or the minutia or the trivia or the upsets but um focus on what matters and and make sure we're it's just like you did at 911 i mean you mm -hmm. know those really intense moments you make you realize you know hold the people you love close and and appreciate every breath and um and that's it's it's beautiful yeah yeah absolutely and then so you so you had been involved with the x prize you then got involved with virgin galactic got on the list to fly there we've done a lot else so you have your space space kind leadership course what's what where did that come from how did that get started and, and what what did, i honestly even don't know a whole lot about it yeah that's a good question i um there's there's, there's like so many pieces of the origin story I'm sure. um but um the crystallizing moment was um in 2014 um i was out in mojave um, for one of our test flights um and uh, that was the day um, that the feather mechanism was deployed mm. early and the wings came off the ship and we mm. had a, 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 we call it a bad day, a disaster. We lost yes. the spaceship yeah. and we lost a pilot. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was a very hard day. And it reminded, you know, I was sixth grade when challenger disaster happened when we lost our first space shuttle and then mm -hmm. in 2000 and then i worked at johnson space center at nasa um and really felt um like it was important to make sure that never happens again that we learn the mm -hmm. lessons from it and um learn to take care of ourselves and each other and um and have con t tough conversations and um it, it to me, it was, it's always been a very human problem. It's not mm -hmm. a technical issue. hundred um, percent. You know, yes, there was rubber and it was cold, yeah. um, but rubber cold doesn't equal death um, unless yeah. there's people who are like, oh, who are not listening to each other or misrepresenting the information or under pressure and stress from outside forces that give them to make decisions that maybe we shouldn't have. So it's the people that are dealing with the hardware that makes the problem. I mean, there's, you have to deal with both. You, you also, you yeah. want to, have to make sure your technical things are all lined up per, well. Um, but you also, I felt like our industry wasn't putting enough um, attention on making sure the people side of the equation was being taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, that our egos were being kept in check, that we were um, healing rifts that are building up between different departments and teams or between individuals. Like, I can't believe he said that to me. Did you hear how he's talking to me in that meeting? Mm -hmm. oh, I tried to me. Um, and when you have that kind of tension building up between humans, um, it's going to compromise our, our work. And what we do is so technical and so precise that those things can uh, have disastrous consequences. And so yeah. um, after the Columbia accident, I was like, I can't believe in 2003, I said, I can't believe we did this again. Um, and I really felt like it was my job to to um, help us learn those lessons that we hadn't learned um, before. And then, then when it hit so close to home, I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I've got to do something. And so 20, that was October, 2014. Uh, that spring, we launched the first ever Jedi training at Virgin Galactic. And I um, I mean, it was just, it was completely ad hoc. We did it in a conference room. It was not from on high. It was like, I said, I, these are my friends. So I just said, come, yeah. I put flyers, who wants, who wants to develop themselves? Who wants to be a Jedi? We're doing this. Um, and, you know, we just created this new, new hero's journey for people to go on to deal with their own insecurities, to deal with their own, like, um, cause that's a lot what, what brings these tensions. It's like, yeah. I'm triggered by you because I've got some thing going on with me. And so just mm -hmm. giving them, you know, the pants has to step back and see some of those dynamics and be like, Oh, I, I did do that. Like, Oh, that was me. Oh yeah. I, I wasn't Matt. That was me. Um, help them get some power and agency and help, you know, I'd a guy come in and say he had a 0% relationship with a colleague and, you know, as somebody who's going to fly on the space. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't want that. It sounds safe. Um, and I remember at the end of the course, sort of checking in with him, like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I think it's like at about 80%. Our relationship's like 80% now. I'm like, wait, what? wow. Wow. How did you go from 
zero percent to 80 percent i'm like did you like talk to him or something he's like no it's like i just realized that it was a lot, a lot you know how much what i was bringing to it and i stopped doing that and yeah like all the drama went away and i was like wow great great wow. so um that's how it started i mean there's a lot more to it i mean i also I mean, I started to learn all this stuff because when I was in graduate school at Caltech, I was doing a PhD in, in biology. Well, I didn't finish the PhD, don't worry. Um, my life started to fall apart. And I realized that my overachiever, I'm going to be a NASA astronaut. I'm going to be the first woman on the moon. Mm. I'm going to achieve my way out of this and to, to joy and fulfillment. Um, I realized uh, there, there's no cheese down that tunnel. That wasn't going to work. I, that yeah. I, I was miserable then and I was going to keep being miserable. <laughs> that another achievement on top of it wasn't going to fix it. And so I started the hard inner work, the inner journey to, to like who I am. And, and I was so grateful um, for that intervention in my life at 27, changed the course of my life, helped me heal my relationship with my dad, helped me open up the possibility of romantic relationships for me and open up family and have kids and a grand you know, yeah. have a grandfather, all these things that wouldn't have happened otherwise yeah. if somebody had yeah. been like, Hey, wake up, change path, like interrupt. And I, so that's when I'm trying to go forward. Yeah. I can't think of a better you The way you just said it was so amazing of I'm going to achieve my way out of this. It's, <laughs> it's just the lie that so many of us tell ourselves. And, um, yeah, for anybody who's been on any kind of self-development journey, feel like they hit rock bottom, find, you know, work their way back out. That's so the root of so much of it is just this, or it can be for a lot of people. It certainly was for me, this idea that, um, to, to go down a whole, another rabbit hole of, uh, fantasy instead of sci-fi. I'm a big, uh, fantasy book fan of like the wheel of time. Yes. And that's the whole arc of the story is the main character just for, you know, what seems like 80,000 pages because Robert Jordan never stops writing. Um, <laughs> he's just all about getting harder and harder and I have to be harder. And it's not until he has that real as you know, that it's, it's this arc of so many heroes journeys of that realization that you have to kind of let go of that ego. Um, it's, it's such an important lesson to learn. Yeah, exactly. I had, um, an astronaut friend. I, when I was working at Johnson space center, I was working really closely with the MDs in the astronaut office and became really good friends with Dr. Chuck Brady. And, um, he was just a delight, just an incredible human being. And I really enjoyed getting to know him and him sharing with me all his journey and going to space and how profound it was for him. And, um, 10, you know, he, Five years after I met him, he left the NASA. He retired from NASA as an astronaut. And five years after that, he went back to the Navy. Um, he committed suicide uh, or allegedly committed suicide. Of, you know, there's reports and of a, that he died of allegedly self-inflicted wounds. Um, and so that was also a big uh, shake, wake up for me, sort of. And I wanted to be able to tell that story to my my community, my industry, and be like, hey, anyone else here think we can yeah. that getting to space is going to solve our problems and make us okay, make us enough? Yeah. Um, well, you know, guess what? There's there's plenty of ast NASA astronauts. People have been to orbit. People have spent time two weeks in space um, that still are not happy. You're still mm -hmm. having to work through all their own their own challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it became really important to me not to stop wanting to go to space or to stop wanting mm -hmm. to build rockets, no. but be like, we got to do this also, because mm -hmm. if we want to really have that star Wars or star Trek future for humanity, we have to work on creating the, the, the culture and the humans that go along mm -hmm. with the technology. <laughs> our intelligence is progressing a lot faster than our wisdom. And we need to sort of <laughs> catch it up a bit. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And you see the same thing in, you know, Michael Phelps has done a lot of work with Olympic athletes and trying to bring to light this idea that so many Olympic athletes, um, af right after the Olympics suffer from major depression and, and have a lot that they have to go through. And it, I think a lot of it comes back to this. I'm going to accomplish my way out of this. I'm going to succeed my way out of this. You're, I mean, 
you're touching on, it's such an amazing message to bring to people and you're, and it's a very hard message and potentially vulnerable. Me- like you, you have to be vulnerable to hear it and be in it. How, I mean, I have a, a, so many questions about this, but my first would be, how do you think about creating a space where people can talk about these kinds of things, especially in a world where, you know, we live in a world these days where it very much, it's like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I only want to be around things that make, that reinforce me. How do you create a space where people can embrace that uncomfortableness and talk about these issues? Yeah, I think that's my favorite part of space kind training. Um, or what I'm most proud of is that we do create that space. Um, and it is really magical. It's like, it's like no other zoom call you'll have this week. I say, um, cause, and I, I think I, we have that because I set, I create the space by being vulnerable myself. Like I do all the assignments alongside them. Cause I'm like, look, I need this just as much as you all do. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm not done. I'm not fixed. I'm not yeah, perfect. Never. I'm like, I need to be training also. So I'm doing this. It's like an aerobics instructor. I'm like, I'm doing this to stay in shape too. <laughs> Um, and so I said, you know, I come in, we do, we start off the day with highs and lows and, you know, I'll share like, you know, i lost my temper at my kids again. And, and like, I'm still struggling with this and I don't know what to do. And, um, and I'm disappointed because I, my flight just got delayed. Um, and so we, we talk authentically and vulnerable. I mean, m- my book is called the new right stuff and the, you know, the old right stuff was being smart and being tough and being able to handle, endure anything. And I say the new right stuff is being authentic and vulnerable um, and inspiring. And that's what we, that's what we need now. And, and so, yeah, I share in the book, I share a lot of my stories and my journey and my, my faults. (laughs) Um, And and luckily when I, you know, create that space and open up that space, people will step into it and we'll start off like, when we do when we do introductions, the first class is just introductions, and and the way is is what we same thing we did at our dinner, Earthrise dinner, where I where you were, is we share something that we're struggling with, um, mm-hmm. and then you share what you're on Earth to do, your your mission, your vision, and it's fascinating because people will share the most pow- incredible things that they're struggling with, they're dealing with, and it's so raw, it's so real, and like mm. aging parents, cancer diagnosis, you know, being being laid off, like bulimia. Um, and so everyone's like, oh, whoa, this just got real, real fast. Um, mm. And so because somebody's willing to be courageous like that, um, it it gives other people the the space to to follow suit. And we create a safe space where you don't have to, too. We're like, mm. choose your, I always, in every exercise, I always give them a choose your own adventure. I'm like, look, if you want the most impactful version of this exercise, when you get in that breakout room with your buddy, you read them exactly what you wrote on in the exercise verbatim. No, no filter, just share your, your mm-hmm. heart out. And mm-hmm. I'm like, if that's too much intense for you, paraphrase, you know, like, great. Hey, and if that's too much for you, just talk about what it was like writing it. Like, wow, that was yeah. really intense. I don't can't believe I, you know, we brought up a lot of stuff for me that I'm still <laughs> dealing with. So, so they, you know, we make a safe space for, you know, we have introverts and external yes. 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 cultures. We have people from all over the world. So making sure it's a safe space for everyone to engage to choose their own adventure, engage at the level that, that they're ready to. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think for any other facilitators watching or, or listening, I think it's a really good sense of, I think, to think about how you start any kind of facilitated session and that to really realize that you're setting the stage for how things are going to go. And sometimes it's easy for us to get into kind of a, a rote system of, of how we start, we, you know, we start with the title slide and give an introduction and give the, the course objectives. And it's just like <laughs> the standard thing. And of course, then when we're 12 minutes in and we want people to engage, it's difficult to get them to engage because they've already checked. They've already said, oh, I've seen this movie before. I know what's <laughs> happening here. And this is something that I can, I can do while I'm on my phone versus what you just talked about of starting from like, no, this is what this is about. <laughs> like, we're going to start real because this is meant to be real. And then people, oh, 
Like I, I haven't seen this movie. I, okay. I'm going to be here and pay attention and really take part. Cause I think you're right. Um, it's surprising. I'm constantly surprised and I'm constantly surprised. Even if I have some sense of a room of like who I think is going to engage and not engage, I'm, I'm never right. It's always, yes. you never know who's going to be the one that steps forward and sets like a new standard for what participation in this session is going to look like. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like it's, there's many components to it. What, how do you have this mix? Is it, how long is it? There's journaling, like, like what are the kind of different modalities of, of how this, this training works, works, works itself out? It's eight weeks. Um, we meet once a week over Zoom. We do an hour in together, and then we have a fifteen-minute, um, like, small group session. So, like, there's about forty people in the main Zoom, and then okay. you have a TA and a small group, just to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak yep. um, and be heard. So, yep. you know, the fifteen minutes at the end is for the six people, so everyone gets to talk. Mm -hmm. Basically, yep. because I don't want. Nobody's going to listen for that long. And I don't even lecture much. Like it's mostly discussion and, and, and exercises because I have a short attention span, which I consider a great gift because I, yeah. when I get bored, I know that they're getting bored. So, yeah. um, we'll, yeah. we switch and I'll, you know, keep it short. Um, awesome. and the modalities. Yes. I mean, I, I, the other trick is I, I use star Wars. I mean, I use, I use mm. Yoda, um, mm -hmm. and you know, when we used to meet in person at galactic before COVID, um, you know, we, I'd show clips from the movie and, you know, you have Yoda on screen and people, it's just, and he talks about the force and it just, the music, John, you know, Williams, you're just like, I'm in, like, what do I need to do? I want to, I want to train. Um, so that's really powerful. We start off with dancing, um, nice. one minute of dancing just to, you know, get in your body and, and change gears. And I tell them, if you're not a dancer, just do jumping jacks, like, you know, cool, whatever your, whatever yeah. level you can handle. Um, but it's, you know, just to change things up and show them that this isn't normal. This is, this isn't anything you've ever done before. This is a totally yeah. new journey. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. So very cool. We... Very cool. And so you, you, and then I guess the final question I have with it is, is, you know, you, you talked about, you know, there's a lot of goals to just kind of make people learn more about themselves have a little bit of vulnerability. Do you, what, what are you trying to, what's the, your goal for somebody to get going from the beginning to the end? What's the biggest change that you're hoping to make with them? That they realize that winning isn't the gold medal or the astronaut pin. That winning is loving who you are and enjoying yeah. every day and having relationships um, that you're proud of. Yeah. And then go to space on top of that, you're, you're golden. <laughs> <Just> yeah. <joking. laughs> um, yeah. So we, we give them real assignments. I give them real assignments in their life challenges and they don't have, you know, I'm not, it's not a degree granting program. So then they're not going to get an A, um, yeah. although they're overachievers, yeah. so they're going to try to get an A anyway. So that like, that's helps, but like, you know, I'll give you an assignment to go upgrade your relationship with your parents. Like who does mm. that? Nobody's going to assign that to you. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, Thing that's really going to help us adult and help us, you know, become who we've always wanted to be and grow up, um, yeah. which is what we need to do as a species. And to do it as a species, apparently we have to do it as individuals. And, <laughs> there's not, there's and not so, a pill yet. There's not a. <laughs> so it gets really personal. Um, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, we always talk about bringing your whole self to work. You know, if somebody's got a, you know, a relate, a, a romantic relationship that's rocky, like that's going to affect your work. You're going to be mm -hmm, distracted. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be doing your best work. As, you know, so as a space person, like I want my team to be whole and complete, not just at work, but yeah. with their families, with their romantic relationships, with their finances, with their health. Like if they're overweight and they're going to go in, you know, they're going to have to be hospitalized. Like you know, if, if their health is impacting their cognitive ability or their physical abilities at work, like all those things impact us. So, so yeah. So for me, the training isn't like how to deal with your subordinates or how to better handle your mm -hmm. schedule, like how to make your life work so that you yeah. can show up powerfully. Yeah. And we kind of skipped over it earlier, just for, for anybody, you know, this, this, for anybody that this feels maybe too touchy feely for something to do at work, or you're into it, but you don't think you're 
organization would buy into it. The Challenger and Columbia accidents are because they were so well reported and and had such thorough investigations. They are such tremendous case studies in why this stuff is important for an organization, because both of those disasters that cost so many lives, yes, there was a technical failure, but it was a technical failure that didn't necessarily need to cost lives. And it was the human error, the, it was the human element that made it so that the technical error cost lives. And it was all about everything exactly that you're talking about. So for anybody out there who's trying to find ways to convince their organizations to do this stuff or find good intros into explaining to people why this is important, look look those up because they are tremendous stories um, and, and case studies in, in this stuff. And also retention. Like, I don't know, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've heard aerospace companies talking about their retention being mm -hmm. abysmal and mm -hmm. being like, Oh, they're just finding better opportunities at other companies. We can't compete or they've got, uh, you know, whatever explanation they're coming up with, you know, they're, they're, we want to be close to their family or they want to make more money or they need to move up in their title. No, it's because things got rough with their boss yeah. or things got rough with a the colleague. There, there was too much yeah. tension and friction in the human relationships. Nine times out of 10, that's what causes yes. your retention issues. Like I can't deal with these people anymore. Yeah. I'm out. And, that, and we don't have any other skill sets, any other tools we're given to resolve this. And you go to HR and that never helped. <laughs> um, uh, but, but we're not empowering people with the tools just to, to solve those those frictions that show up between humans every day, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. so people just leave. So if you have retention issues, so if you're if you're dealing with management, just be like, look, here, this will this will help with retention. People aren't want to aren't yeah. going to want to leave. And I've had people say, we had somebody leave and then they came back because they're like, oh, we went to somewhere else and it was way worse out there. Yeah. We want to come. <laughs> we're, we're treated as humans and they understand how important relationships are and how important it's to take care of the whole human. They're like, we didn't know how rare that was, but you guys yeah. are the only company that does that, so we're coming back here. It's it's so funny. Do you know who Gary V is? Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> I don't think so. He, he's a media personality. He runs a media agency in New York. And so he's, he's really big on, you know, all, all the social media channels. And he talks about this a lot because he always talks about how the superpower of business is empathy. And their head of HR is called the chief heart officer. Um, so they're a very, you know, people focused organization. And he says exactly what you mentioned happens all the time of he has people, they come in straight out of college. They're working for him. They're working really hard. They, they um, think they they think there's some better opportunity. They go elsewhere, and then a year later, their back's like that place was a disaster. Like I got to come back to here. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's, it. yeah. yeah, it's yeah. incredible what it can do. Um, well, Loretta, this has been this has been a lot of fun, a great conversation. I want to kind of close it out with with a few questions that I try to ask every guest guest. Um, so first off is, uh, what is one book or podcast that you think everyone should read, and why? Uh, Michael Singer, uh, book or podcast, but the book I like the best, he's got three, but the, I think the best one to, uh, start with is living untethered, his third book. Um, okay. and he's just, he's fabulous. He's like a yogi and he was the CEO of a billion dollar publicly traded company. So he's like this fabulous guy who's got a, able to traffic in both worlds. He runs the temple of the universe now in central Florida. And he's nice. just like, the wisest American I've encountered. And I was like, wow, that's fantastic. So he breaks, he breaks down real, real simple, real easy, accessible and fun and always with great space metaphors. So I'm, all, I'm, I'm like, you had me at the space metaphors. Yeah, <laughs> that's excellent. Awesome. Okay. And I think we've been touching on this next question a lot throughout this episode, but, um, what is one skill? What's the one skill that has helped you most be successful throughout your life? Um, called getting off it, um, which is something I learned at Landmark. It's just like being able to let go of your upsets or resentments. Um, mm. And the faster you can do it, the better. I'm still not as fast as my daughter. She's really good. Um, and it's just like, instead of just letting it eat you up, like when I'm upset about, or if I'm pissed off at something, like it's hurting me way more than it's hurting them. Yeah. And so learning to like, just like let that go. Um, because so then I can function again. I'm 
high, I can become a high functioning human again instead of just, mm-hmm. just like a, you know, a tornado of grievances. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a superpower, you know, and you walk around and you'll see people flying off the handle about their subset or their righteousness about this or that. And they might be right, but they're also miserable. So yeah, being able to learning, seeing that and being like, Oh wait, I don't need to do that anymore. And like learning, giving, practicing, like just, just letting it go. I want, yeah. I want to enjoy my dinner tonight. Have a good yeah. time. I was, it's funny that just triggered a memory in me of, um, I'm, I'm listening to Elon Musk's interview on the Lex Friedman podcast that just came out yesterday, I think. And at one point he's talking about how, um, uh, just go watch like a group of chimpanzees and that's just your limbic system in real time, right? Yeah. Like how it's just like extreme emotion and you touch somebody and they fly off the handle and like it, it's all in there. And it's just like, we just have other stuff built on top of it that you got to learn to, um, learn to let the newer parts control, control you rather than the older parts. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Um, and then the final question, you know, you've gotten to work with a lot of different people. You've been inside a lot of organizations. Um, what's the most common opportunity you see for organizations to improve talent development? Uh, making it personal, making it human. If you're the lead for development, like be vulnerable, be authentic, share yourself, skip that whole PowerPoint slide, skip the objective slide, just get real with people and give them a space to be real and they, they'll follow you to the moon and back. I love it. That is such a great place to end. Loretta, if, if people want to learn more about you, find out more about you, where, where should they go? How can they, how can people get in touch with you or, or learn more about you? Thank you. Uh, you can go to spacekind.org to check out our the, the space kind trainings, um, or Loretta whitesites.com for on, find me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, have a great evening and I look forward to talking to you again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked the discussion, make sure to hit like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. As a reminder, if your team is struggling keeping up with the training development demands of your organization, we want to help. Better Everyday Studios is a full service instructional design team that can help you with everything from ideation to actual content creation and delivery. Please reach out to us using the link in the episode notes below. Have a great day.